At Five Star Bank, community is at the heart of what we do. Every day we strive to have thoughtful solutions for our customers and help our communities prosper. Honest dialogue about the issues affecting the region is vitally important to that prosperity. We are proud to be part of the conversation and hope you'll join in. We're in the midst of billing ourselves as the farm to fork capital of the world. Much of the attention has been focused on the region's chefs and restaurants, but there is another hotbed of farm to fork creativity, and it's happening in our own kitchens. Grocery stores are helping to support that return. Taylor's Market is one such neighborhood grocery store that has been in operation since 1962. Danny and Kathy Johnson are the owners of both Taylor's Market and Taylor's Kitchen. They join us to share their story and their thoughts on our community's rediscovery of the joys of local food. What has birthed this revolution, do you think, Danny, in exploring local food? People want to know where their food comes from. They're insanely curious about where is it coming from. There's Why is that so important to us today? Health benefits. There's all the, the Diet Cokes, the Coke, Pepsis, people are trying to get away from that and they want to know exactly where their food is. There's a certain segment of the population that really cares. Hmm. Kathy, when people are looking at trying to improve their lifestyle, it seems like that there's a lot of confusion out there. When we talk about farm to fork, are there any rules of the road that we should be looking at in order to understand what's local and healthy and, and what's not? I think that there are rules. Um, our personal belief in what we eat at home is to eat whole foods. So we try not to eat a lot of processed foods and we do like to support our local farmers. And I just really think it's important that people cook and they find um, a family communion sitting around the dinner table. And I think if you just go out and buy whole foods, tomatoes, corn, beef that you know where it comes from, hamburger that you certainly know who's grinding it and that there are not a hundred different beef that go into your burger is very important. And I do believe it also has to do with supporting our local farmers. One thing that I think we also have to realize is sometimes the best product is not local. So at Taylor's, we try and get the very best products and as many local as we can. So we shouldn't, we should try to buy local, but we shouldn't be absolutely dogmatic about it. I do agree with that. The, the, push though has been local, 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 and a lot on organic. Correct. It, what is really, and, and recently recently, there's been a debate as to what's organic or what's not. Can, can either of you share some information on uh, what is that debate that's going on right now? The debate that's going on is there, there's a little bit of some fraud going on with, with some of the people labeling things organic. I'll, I'll go back to using the term natural. You can everything can be labeled natural. You put natural on something, and some people have been using these buzzwords descri describing certain types of food. Organic is a whole different cat. It, it's a different standard when you're raising something organically. It's gonna be, you know, a, an organic peach is not gonna be the size of a softball. It's gonna be a little bit smaller. It's gonna have more of an intense flavor. So the organic standards are pretty strict but there are people that are just labeling things organic that aren't organic. There's not really any policing of it, and that is, that's what the issue is. And the same can be said for things like meat, which is meat that has antibiotics in it or uh, chicken, turkey, things like that. Can you give us any advice on what we should be looking for when we're going into the store so that we can feed our own families? We do have a few organic things at Taylor's Market. Um, one of the things that's hard for meat departments is organic has to be completely separate from any other kind of meat. So for a small grocery store like us, it's a little more difficult because if, if Danny um, cuts a piece of organic meat up, then we have to clean everything, sanitize everything before we can put another piece of meat on. Um, I think that at Taylor's we try and do a more natural approach, correct? Rather than organic. Our organic has to be sealed in plastics. We do have organic chicken. 
So that we would give to you sealed in the plastic to keep it organic. We have an organic chicken we get from Mary's, Pittman Farms out of Sanger, down by Fresno. It comes in a sealed package. Customers will come in, can you cut that up for me? And I let them know right away. As soon as I touch this, it's no longer organic because I have to sanitize my knife, my butcher block, everything. They're like, that's fine. Don't worry about that. So the organic standards, as far as having an organic butcher shop, I would essentially have to have two different butcher shops. Really? So we do what they call a never ever program. So it means never had any an antibiotics or hor hormones. Everything we sell in our butcher shop has no antibiotics or hormones ever. It's sustainably raised and it's humanely raised and humanely harvested. Do, do the health benefits and the taste uh, show themselves by, by adhering to looking for products like that as opposed to just buying something normally? It, it does. Uh, one of the best compliments we get is when people eat our hamburger or they'll eat a steak and they say that's one of the best steaks I've ever had in my life. That's pretty gratifying when they come back and tell us that. It, it, it makes you feel good. You, you tell them, especially people who are new to the store or they're skeptics are like, man, you know, I, I can find chicken a lot cheaper. I'm like, you can, but you're not going to find better chicken. Try this chicken. If you don't like it, bring it back and we'll talk about it and I'll put you into something else. Hmm. Now, your, your market uh, has been around since 1962 and I've heard it referred to as uh, Mayberry in the middle of the city or something like that. Tell us a little bit about the history of Taylor's Market. Well, it was founded by Roy Taylor in the original, um, I believe it was a Safeway right. originally, and then he took it over and it became Taylor's Market in um, partnership with uh, Ed Shell, who ran the meat department. So it was two different operations at that point. Um, and then in 1985? 87. 87, we bought in. And so there became more partners and we actually purchased the store with partners from Roy Taylor. And then it became um, Taylor's Market with Danny and his partners. Um, and it's just been a neighborhood grocery store where we've had generations of people who come in and say, oh, I shopped here when I was a child and now they're bringing their grandchildren in. And it's just a very warm comfort environment. We know all of our customers unless they're new and in which case we get to know them. And Danny can even do things like tell, if a husband comes in, he'll say, oh no, your wife was already here and you're having chicken tonight, <laughs> which comes in handy. So then they don't buy another chicken. That's interesting. That is a level of, of personal touch. What's interesting is that um, I, I've noticed that recently in the, in the grocery industry, that a lot of very large national corporations are going to smaller type of formats, more neighborhood oriented. What's going on with that? It's, it's a throwback and they're, they're trying to compete with service. It's a very competitive indus industry. The margins are narrow and service is where you can compete. Every, all the same products are out there, all, a lot of the same products. You go into all these different stores, everybody kind of has the same widget. It's how you're, you're presenting it and what you're doing with it and how you're servicing that customer. In all the major cities years ago, there always was, even in the small towns, there was a lo the local grocer and everybody knew the local grocer. Well, it kind of went away from that. You go into some, some towns, the town where I went to meat cutting school in Oregon, the main streets dried up because they put a big Walmart and, and out in the suburbs. So they're, they're realizing that in the urban cores that they're rebuilding, they have to have some grocery stores and they want some neighborhood stores and there's that certain intimacy. That's a compliment we get all the time is, it's just so cool, it's so, it's intimate in here. Hmm. It's a, interesting. I want to go back to the, uh, the, the farm to fork movement. Now, cynics are, have been saying that this is a fad, marketing gimmick, and that five years from now we'll have moved on to something else. Do you feel that we as a society really are permanently attached to trying to eat healthier food and live a bit of a healthier lifestyle? I would like to think so. Danny and I were both raised in a farm gardening environment. You guys are both local, right? We are. We're, um, I'm from Penryn, he's from Loomis, so we grew up in an environment that there are gardens and farms everywhere. So we were very accustomed to having whole foods on our table all the time. 
Uh, my mother and I and grandmother, we canned all of our food. So I think the farm to fork movement has been a part of our lives, a com all of our life. And I would like to think that it's a healthier environment for everyone. So I would really love to see them stick to the farm to fork idea. It's um, the less your food has to travel, the better it's going to be when you get it. Um, I do believe there are health um, benefits because of the bees. And so that even helps with your allergies. You guys raise bees. We do. We have a couple of hives at our farm in Loomis. Um, and we think, well, we will serve them at the store, the honey at the store, and at the restaurant. And I think that it's something important to have because it does help you with allergies. Now, you, you at one point had the bees at the store and you had to move them. The queens, there's, there's a thing called colony collapse where the queen, the, the workers go out and they'll get into pesticides, they'll bring it back and it kills the queen. As soon as the queen dies, the bees die. This, is a na this isn't just a local this issue, is a, a national issue. International. International. Like, international, but it's more of a national problem, but it's becoming an international issue as well. Nationally, the percentage of honeybees are just dropping off, and they figured out it's the pesticides that, that people are using. So we had them behind the store, and it just didn't work. So we moved them up to the farm. They've been up there about six weeks now, and they're, they're absolutely thriving. So you guys have your store, you have a restaurant, and you also have a farm as well. What do you grow? We have stone fruit, so we have peaches, plums, persimmons, we have apples, we have a quince tree that I reclaimed, it was my grandmother's, planted for her, and I found it tangled up with blackberries. We're doing all the pumpkins for the store. Last year, Kathy came across um, a French pumpkin with a bunch of knots on it, and that was wildly successful, so we have a bunch of those. We do all of our heirloom tomatoes. We're doing butternut squash this year. We have, uh, that covers quite a bit. I'm trying to think what else is up there. Blackberries, so blackberries are coming in, so we'll do cobblers. Hmm. The, um, so the farm, you have the farming operation, you've got the store, and then you created the restaurant as well. And uh, the Taylor's Kitchen. Yes. Okay, what was the inspiration for that? We needed to expand the kitchen at Taylor's Market because we do make all of our own potato salad, macaroni salad, anything that you can buy in the deli at Taylor's is housemade. Um, and we needed to build a kitchen to meet current health safety codes. So we started a kitchen in the building we had next door. And the more we looked at it and we looked at the price of the kitchen, it seemed only logical to add a restaurant. So that's what we did. For most people, that, that's a very, very nerve-wracking decision. How's it gone? Um, so far, it's gone well, and I had actually done accounting for a couple of restaurants in town for numerous years, so I had some idea of what I was getting into. Um, and it's gone well. We had construction ran over, and we happened to be in Paris at the time, so that was a little trying to try and make sure everything was going well while we were out foraging. But so far, so good. I think we offer a nice um, community environment like we do in the store. And you guys just recently won an award, right? Yes, we did. We won an open table award for the top 100 restaurants in the nation, um, small restaurants. Neighborhood restaurants. Neighborhood, Neighborhood restaurant. restaurant. Hmm. Okay. Now, and you talked about Paris. I, uh, bef before uh, we came on, I was asking about where all of these products come from that you all make internally. Yeah. And you were sharing with us that uh, you guys travel fairly extensively. What is the, the, the oddest place that you found an inspiration for a new product? I don't know that it was the oddest place. Um, there is one odd place, and I'll tell you about it later, but New York is actually where we get all of our corner grocery store ideas. Because in Manhattan, everywhere you go, there are more corner grocery stores than there are other stores. So we can walk in and we can see um, meat departments, little tiny butcher stores, cheese shops um, and the little tiny corner store and they have such little space that they offer everything and it's well displayed and we're always finding products. I think um, one of the fun products we found was in Florence two years ago and it was a, um, oh, well maybe you can explain it better Danny, the pig's head. Oh the. Um, it was like a porchetta. It's, it's the Copa de Testa. So they basically boned out a pig's head took all the, the meat, turned it into, it's a fancy head cheese, it's Italian head cheese. Hmm. So we found that in Florence. Florence, we've got a lot of inspiration from. Really? 
as far as the butchers there, there was um, like a porchetta. I, I'm like, oh, I can do that, I can make that. A zampone, which is a boned out picnic shoulder. All this came, we're looking at the butcher shops in Florence, communicating with them, letting them know, look, you don't speak a lot of English, I don't speak a lot of Italian, but we both cut up the same stuff. <laughs> <laughs> so it was more of a point and uh, oh yeah yeah demonstrate yeah. yeah you let him know you know uh, I, I would have never considered butchering to be an international language but yeah it, it it's, definitely is yeah it's always it's a great topic it's a it's a great conversation starter when people say what do you do you know I'm a butcher you, even in the food world you say we own a grocery store everybody connects mm -hmm. you actually offer butchering classes yes and you've been doing that for a couple of years. What's the interest in, in butchering? Are, have those been successful? Wildly successful. Sometimes I ask myself the same question. What is the interest? It, it's, people are fascinated by, by it. One of my taglines always is, people are like, I'm used to seeing that in a package. And I'm like, I've looked far and wide and I cannot see any of these animals in a package. I've yet to find one in a package in a field. They sell out. We started them in 2008 after we built the kitchen, got the kitchen done. It was kind of like, let's start this Butchering 101 thing. And it's just taken off from there. We do hands-on classes, which that was the next step. People are liking that. Um, amazingly enough, the women are more successful at the hands-on classes than the, the men. Really? They tend to listen better. So I, I, that, that part doesn't surprise me. I think it has to do with a little bit of dexterity and working um, on small items. Mm-hmm. So yeah, we, we offer, we do a seafood class. We, we do all kinds of, anything to do well, with. Well, help us home cooks out. What is it that, that uh, I would gain from going to a butchering class is that make a difference in terms of how I prepare food? Well, you would learn about value. You know, there's not a tailor's on every corner, clearly. And that's what I, I always tell them that too. But you want to get to know your butcher. Anthony Bourdain had a great quote is a butcher is somebody you need to get close to and know and trust. Because if you trust your butcher, and Kathy actually got me a shirt, you know, trust your butcher. If you trust your butcher, nothing else matters. <laughs> so, you know, know where your hamburger comes from is one of the key things that I always say. Know where your burger Why? comes from. Why? Because burger is a source of a lot of E. coli. It gets mixed, commingled. A lot of it's not ground in house. A lot of stores don't grind their own hamburger. If you go into a store, you ask the butcher, do you grind your hamburger here? And he says, yes, that's probably a place you want to shop. If he gives you the deer in the headlights look and says, no, not really, I suggest you find another place to shop. It's just important that it's ground in-house and fresh. That's the foundation that Ed Shell taught us years ago about of a butcher shop. That's, that's the number one thing. So what else would I get from going to a butchering class? It would teach people. you how to cut up a chicken. Or does you, it, you does save it, some value on that mm -hmm. instead of buying the parts. We'd Actually, let's talk about chicken. So big debate going on right now. Uh, air chilled versus water chilled chicken. What's that all about? So when they water chill, after the chicken gets harvested or slaughtered, slaughtered. That's, the, that's the term, slaughtered. After it gets harvested, it has to be cooled rapidly. So for years they've been putting it in this big vat of water with a little bit of chlorine. They dip them in there, they bring them down to a chill rather quickly. But when you're thinking about everything that goes into slaughtering a chicken, it's being commingled with a bunch of different blood and guts and all that. With the air chilled, they, they harvest them, they clean them up, they rinse them, then they put them into a big blast chiller. And there's no residual water when you open up a, a package of air chilled chicken, if it comes in a package, you're not gonna have what they call purge. Everybody's opened up a package of other chicken and you open it up and there's all this water. water and That's what they else. call purge. Mm -hmm. That's just extra weight. Air chilled chickens, you're gonna get what you get. There's no extra weight. Does it taste different? It tastes tremendously different. Really? Yes, I could do a blind tasting with you, especially with the Pittman Farms chicken, the Mary's chicken. And I, I guarantee you, you could tell the difference. So, um, a similar thing comes up about, you know, around the holidays, things like turkeys or anything like that. Any advice on how, how do we select a turkey that'll end up being moist or how, how do we prepare that so that that way we can get it right? Let's, can I revisit the chicken thing sure, real quick? Sure. Going back to what you were talking about with, 
you know, is this the farm to fork movement? Is, is that a valid thing or is it just a fad? The major chicken processors in this country, Tyson, Purdue, they are starting to move away from giving hormones and antibiotics to their chickens. It's been pretty controversial within the industry. So the movement is catching on with the big producers. Hmm. So when those guys are starting to catch on to this and go, hey, you know, people want a better quality product, the noise is, is being heard. So this region is having an impact even beyond our own borders. I believe absolutely. so. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. So we've got, uh, you know, we're start, starting to celebrate this heritage, which is ironic because years ago we wanted to run as far away from our agricultural heritage as we could. We're starting to celebrate that heritage here. Are there, are there any events that, that you all say, wow, people should check that out, that uh, people should get involved? The, the Farm to Fork event in, in, in the fall, that's, it's, it's a two weeks and it, it's great. It, it's a blast. When, when they first started it, when the Visitors Convention Bureau you know, got behind it, Mike Test to come to us and he's like, you guys wanna be involved? Yeah, I was a little skeptical. I'm like, man, I hope people embrace this. We've done demos down on Capitol Mall, the butcher demo, and I, I've gotten customers from it. People are like, That's, I've never seen anything like that. Uh, we're, we're gonna do a pig competition where we're gonna have chefs cut up pigs in a allotted time. I was gonna say, you're gonna do that live in front of like, <laughs> like an audience? Yeah, yeah. People really, really yeah, we have it. it. We, have it, all, we really? have it all lined up. Yes, it, that's gonna be um, kind of fun. Huh, interesting, interesting. So uh, one, one more cooking question, yes. which is this. You know, we have a lot of people out there who pride themselves on being able to make the perfect steak. Yes. How do you all make the perfect steak? I think one of our favorite steaks in the world is a Tuscan steak, and so we have a double cut French ribeye. Uh, we call, you and I call that, that's our Tuscan steak, but a traditional Tuscan steak is a porterhouse steak. So that's what we use a ribeye and we sear it on both sides, preferably in a cast iron pan and then finish it in the oven. And then when it's sliced, it's sliced, um, how would you say it, horizontally? Yeah, you kind of just slice it on a bias. With some herbs and butter and salt and pepper and call it a day. Just that simple? That simple. But sear first, bake second? Yes. What temperature? Everything is at 325. <laughs> Everything's at 325? I always say butchers, that's yeah, the standard answer. Yeah, that's a, it is the standard answer. 325 is, is, that's how I was taught and it's been successful. 325, two and a half hours, give or take a little wiggle worm. Not the room. steak. Not the steak, no. but like roast and chickens. It's almost a standard line. So I'm curious, uh, you, you grew up in Penryn, mm -hmm. home of the, the, what used to be the ground cow. Oh uh, yes. Right? You over in Loomis uh, and have been married for how long now? 30, 32 years. Yeah. 32 years. How, how did you two first uh, meet? He threw rocks at me when we were children. <laughs> his, um, I wanted to play baseball. <laughs> <laughs> his, um, my father and his aunt were very good friends and they lived, um, his grandmother lived probably what would be considered two city blocks from um, my grandparents. Mm -hmm. So he was always at his grandmother's helping her out and he would come over and Throw rocks? Throw rocks, we must have been how old? Six or like, seven? Yeah, I was, yeah, five, six, seven, throwing rocks at her, get away from me. It was back in the country <laughs> days where you could let your kids run around. So, for real childhood sweethearts. Uh, yeah. Well, we met in high school again, and that's when we started dating. Mm -hmm. And did both of you independently come to this passion for food? Or, or was this that uh, sort of something that happened along the way? I believe we grew up seeing food grown and eaten and even canned. Uh, and then my uncle, um, who since passed away, introduced us to fine dining and fine food. And he, I think that became our passion. We realized how much more there was in the food world that we hadn't seen from our small town environment. And we started traveling, um, going to nicer restaurants and just figuring out how much we love food. And I'm, I'm an avid cook. Um, Danny's been cooking more. Um, I do all the growing and the meats. So we cook at home at least six nights a week. And we still sit at our kitchen table and have dinner. 
Um, there, even when our children come over, no phones are allowed at our table ever. And a guest is always looked at if their phone happens to accidentally go off. Everyone looks like, oh no, we don't have phones at the table. So that's where we got to know our children every night. So we would sit for a half an hour at least. Wow, six nights a week. And I always wanted to be a butcher. Hmm. It was either play baseball, which I was practicing with my rock throwing, or be a butcher. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you both uh, for joining us today and much success to you. Thank you. And uh, uh, let's all eat healthy. Thank you. All right. And that's our show. Thanks to our guests and thanks to you for watching Studio Sacramento. I'm Scott Syfax. See you next time right here on KVIE. At Five Star Bank, community is at the heart of what we do. Every day we strive to have thoughtful solutions for our customers and help our communities prosper. Honest dialogue about the issues affecting the region is vitally important to that prosperity. We are proud to be part of the conversation and hope you'll join in. All episodes of Studio Sacramento, along with other KVIE programs, are available to watch online at kvie.org video.